and oh my god, I feel like it would knock you out. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Zero to 60. Now, it's three or four days since that last video went up on Dan's wicked N54 powered E46 M3. <laughs> you guys quite like that video and maybe we'll do some more videos on it. Uh, because of my current missing laptop situation, Dan has offered to basically allow me to film some stuff in the shop and basically keep content coming to you guys while I'm in a position where I can't film like I normally would. Now, in that video of the E46 M3, I was trying to sort of push Dan, and I'm sorry about this, push Dan into doing an 8HP swap into that drift car and just to sort of see so that we can get a real world test on how these Lamics work in a proper drift car by somebody that's been drifting. When did you start drifting? Probably 12, 15 years ago. So yeah, Dan's been drifting 12 or 15 years. You've had all sorts of drift cars, manuals, sequentials, you name it, he's played with it. He tried to do the DCT last year. Was it last year or the year before? A uh, year before now. Wasn't quite good enough for his drifting style. So we're gonna know if the Lamic is good or bad or just everything. And I had a Lamic kit, Dan saw the comments how did you get a gearbox so quickly? Oh, I called up a friend at Rockley Auto Parts and they literally had it to me the next week. So this is an 8HP 75. It is a 75. Uh, no, 70. it's a 70. Okay, so it's exactly the same box that we used in the Flomax car. And it is the diesel. Luckily, I had a full N54 8HP Lamic kit with the adapter player, everything. So Dan, before we actually take the manual out of your 46, are you sure you want to do this? Not really. <laughs> Don't ruin my car. Um, yeah, so Dan has sort of put this on me. He said, if this doesn't work, it's my fault and he's probably going to hate me forever because he's going to have to put his manual back in. Uh, so let's hope that my confidence in this setup is, is good enough. But there's something that I'm kind of really excited about. You've still got your... Uh, it like, looks like a sequential shifter, but it's for this type of setup, isn't it? You were yep. using it with the DCT. So we're going to have a full-on sequential style shifter in this car and... A clutch pedal. This was a big thing for you because obviously you still want to have that clutch control mid slide. Yeah. I don't drift, I don't really know. But Dan thinks it's important to have that clutch pedal feel. And even though these are an automatic with a torque converter, they still have five clutch packs in there. There's five clutch packs. So you can lock the converter and then you can disengage and engage the clutches almost like a manual, almost like a Koenigsegg. I'm really excited to play with it. But that's the one thing I'm not too sure on. Did you do much research into using the clutch pedal with the DCT? A little bit. I couldn't get the DCT to work as well as I wanted it to, so I never really got a feeling for how the clutch would feel. It always felt a little light. Um, we put a valve spring under the pedal and it just didn't give the right feel. So I'm gonna have to experiment with that to make sure it feels good once it's actually in the car. In fact, that's something that you guys might be able to help with. So I did speak to a friend of mine last night who does like racing simulators, but not, he spends a lot of money, actually more than this thing's gonna cost on his racing simulator. But he was explaining there's a few different ways to emulate a real clutch pedal. And he said the really good simulators now, they still use a master cylinder. Mm. Uh, I don't know how that works. If somebody's got an idea on how to make a clutch pedal work in this setup, so it feels like a real clutch pedal. And I guess it has to have like a progressive, a progressive, dampening or progressive spring rate. Yeah. It needs to be soft at the top and then get hard. I don't know how to do it. And apparently I've got to work it out. So if anyone's got any ideas, let me know. Dan, the box is here. I'm going to try and get your TCU fitted today. And he's going to get the gearbox out of the car. So let's get the 46 on the hoist and get the manual taken. Yeah. Okay, so I was just having a bit of a chat to Dan. Um, after I finished that clip that you've just seen, he got his, one of his mechanics to start pulling the gearbox out. And the mechanics come back in in an hour and it's out. And that would take me a day. But this is, the E46, he's already bolted the adapter plate on. That is amazing how fast these guys can get stuff done. It's happening. I can't believe it's happening so quickly. So we have the single turbo E46 M3, the manual's out, and we're putting an 8 HP. I'm excited. It's gonna put a bit of pressure on me to do this properly and not let Dan down, but I think we can do it. He's even got the flex plate on. How does he do it so quickly? This is why you go to a shop like Simply Tuning. They just get stuff done. They don't waste time. That is amazing. All right, guys, so what we're looking at, I wonder if it's gonna fit. We've still got the shifter in there from the manual. That's gonna have to get taken out. That's on. Holy crap, gonna get some wiring. I guess I need to get this gearbox pulled apart, get the TCU out and start working on that mechatronics modification. I'm just amazed at how quick this is happening. All right, see you in a sec, guys.
Okay, so we've got the TCU out. In fact, I've covered it up because I don't want to get crap in there. The Mechatronics is here. I don't know the life on this box, but this is probably the dirtiest fluid I've ever pulled out. Got the TCU separated. Dan is going to do the, or one of the guys is going to do the modification to the casing that the TCU sits in, just so it's got some nicer cuts than me with my Parkinson hand Dremel job. I'm going to get Dan to do that. If you've got any questions about how to get the TCU out of the Mechatronics, hit me up in the comments below, but there are some videos on the channel on how to do it, which I can put links to, and it's easy. We've done it before. All right, let's get that top off. This top, not that one. Alright guys, so Dan has cut the top of the TCU off. Now this is normally where I will come in here with a razor blade and basically just pull all these wires off, ready for the PCB to go in. However, off camera, just talking to Brock, who you may have seen from other websites, he has come up with an idea to make a CNC cover, which will involve less, sorry about the lighting, which is going to involve less epoxy, and if we need to change anything later on, you can actually get to the PCB. So let's go and have a look at what he's got planned. So. Brock's got the program. It got a little bit more complicated. Who would have thought a quick job turned into a complicated one? Got the logo on it. There's a bit of design in there. We'll talk about it another time. So what is this machine, Brock? Oh, uh, this is our vertical machining center. CNC mill, basically. Vertical machining center. Uh, he's told me a little bit about it. We'll go into it in detail another time, because I know there's going to be some people that are interested in how it works and what's going on. But do you want to start cutting our little 8 HP thing? Sure. What's the aluminium it's made out of? Uh, 6061T6 billet. Right. That's pretty much what we use. I have no idea what that is. Anyway, so he's copied the program onto the machine. And, oh my god. I feel like it would knock you out. All done. So, I mean, that was, just, I don't know, it took you quite a while, but that's pretty cool. It it's feels good. expensive. It <laughs> feels expensive. Who would have thought? Did it machine this side? It did, but when we uh, when we do production runs on that, we'll make a nice toolpath for that. It's, it just feels so smooth. Oh, yeah. It doesn't feel like it's been machined. It feels, I don't know, I haven't played with much billet stuff. You can feel those, yeah. those lines, but that is just like a mirror. Like you could polish that. <laughs> That's really cool. All right. I guess I better get this PCB soldered and see if it fits. Well, I hope you can hear me all right. I know they're messing around with some thousand horsepower V8 Commodore. Um, I've just soldered the PCB. Now, if you watch my first Turbo Lamek install, I had a fair bit of trouble doing the PCB. The second one I did was much easier. I switched to lead solder and a better soldering iron. I went to a gas soldering iron. And we didn't have lead solder, so I thought instead of ruining Dan's PCB that's going to go in his good car, I better go and buy some lead solder. I did that, but I was still having trouble getting it to stick. Brock, the engineer here, he came over and he actually showed me what he did to make it work. He scratched up the soldering pads. Hopefully the GoPro's picking it up. Uh, and as soon as they were scratched up and scuffed up, the solder stuck to them really easy. So I've been having trouble getting the solder to stick to the pads on the TCU, the metal stick up bits and yeah it's just I wasn't scraping them down enough now hopefully that's going to sink into a few people that have had the problem because I know people that have been in my situation where you haven't had issues soldering before and then you really struggle to get the heat to go into these boards and then other people just solder them with no problems and I think it comes down to the way I was cleaning off the original TCU connections which are the wires that go from the factory TCU up to these pins and I normally just break them off with a flat blade uh, like a knife in fact this knife right here. That's how I broke them all off. Or I guess some people might file or ground them off and that little bit of a file is enough to get it to stick really nicely. So if you're doing this, make sure you just give the, the pads a little bit of a scuff up. It does something with the zinc apparently, somebody was saying. Anyway, uh, let's go and see if that cover fits. All right, Brock, I'm gonna let you have 
We'll see if it fits. We'll see if it fits. Oh, it's even tight. Beautiful. It's almost like you'd measured it or something. <laughs> That's cool. I still can't get over that finish. Although the, the light sort of brings up the... Yeah, it makes it a bit hard to see. Well, it brings up the, um, the machine finishing. Oh, yeah, it looks more much. billet now. Take the light away, it looks normal. Um, so that's, oh, well, that's actually quite tight. Well, that's gonna be way better because we'll be able to just do, everyone, just a quick seal right up in the corner and that'll save filling the whole thing up with epoxy. I guess I better set up a test bed and we'll see if my soldering's worked. So I'm working in somebody else's workshop here, so it's all a bit, bit janky, but we've got the 12 volt power supply going into a cut up six HP harness, which feeds into the turbo Lamic six HP connector into the Lamic, into the Lamic screen, where we're gonna read our error codes. Hopefully there won't be any. And then we've got it connected to the just soldered PCB sitting on the mechatronics. Let's see if I'm gonna look like an idiot. Can you fire it up, Ethan? Okay, nothing, no smoke. It's gotta have it. error 33, which from memory is CAN bus. But that's it. Can we change program modes? I don't think we can without a shifter. No, right, we can't. Okay, that's fine. But just error 33. Let me just double check. Error 33, CAN 2 error. That's it. So that error is caused by there's no CAN bus connection to the car. Um, that's it. That means all the solenoids are connected. Soldering worked. Whew. All right. Let's go and get an update on how the car's going. All right, so it's come time to put the Leeson Engineering, it needs your name on there as well, really, Dan. Oh, Dan's back. Um, PCB cover. Now, you've got a Worth product, Super Silicon RTV Black, that's basically just going to seal this and keep all the transmission fluid out of it. I had spoken to Lucas from Turbo Lamic a couple of times about this because when you do it his way without the PCB and you just solder the wires on the back, you don't actually need to keep that out of the transmission fluid. However, he has had interference problems when you do the PCB version because obviously everything's getting pretty close to this big metal piece. And if you get too much metal or clutch particles in the transmission fluid, you can get issues with the way the system works. So we just got to try and keep this section free from transmission fluid. Sensitive stuff, this. Have you ever had to take this off of something? Yeah. And it comes away without damaging everything? No. Okay. No, it does not. All right. Well, that's definitely quicker than the epoxy anyway. It looks a lot better. God, that looks cool. That's it. That's sick. Easy. Right. Now, I said I was going to get an update on the car just before. Let's actually go and see how the car is going. Okay, so I've finally got a chance to have a look at the car. They have got a blank off plate where the original shifter was coming down. I think I showed you guys that before. That is the Turbo Lamic adapter plate from the N54 to the 8HP70 from an N57 diesel. Um, yes, I think that was all straightforward. We did have to change the way that this starter bolt went in and that is just because of the way that Dan has this particular starter done with his single turbo setup. Now, let me show you the inside where the shifter is and that's where it gets pretty cool. Okay. Try not to damage the uh, <laughs> M3 doors. Okay, so the clutch pedal's still in there, obviously, but this is the shifter that we're going to use. Actually, we need some light. We need some light. Hopefully you can see it. It is the DCT shifter brand, and it's designed to emulate the feel of a sequential. Shit, it's quite hard. And obviously designed to be abused whilst it's drifting. Dan is going to be cool. And Dan has also got a M3 SMG steering wheel. So we're going to have paddles. He's going to have the shifter. Need to work out how we're going to do the, the drive as well. All right, so we've got the top cover on the TCU. We can see that billet plate in there. And yeah, it does look cooler than the epoxy that I've done on the other ones. Um, however, I've got the screws back in. It's now time to put it back into the gearbox. The only thing you really need to pay attention when you do this is to make sure you line up the park lock with this lever here. This one actually had a park lock lockout thing on it, so it can't actually get out of park anyway. But yeah, let me get it back in. I don't have my tripod, which is really sucked today because I haven't been able to film as much as I'd like, but let's get the TCU back in.
And I know I like to use the electric ratchet, but once you've done some tight, make sure you go around and torque every single one to the correct spec, which I think is around 15 Newton meters, which I'm just doing now with this uh, torque wrench thing. And everything's good. Okay, something with this particular gearbox has been different to the other ones I've done. It doesn't have the canister for the stop start feature. The eight HPs, uh, they have this canister that's designed to keep clutch pressure on the clutches when the car shuts off at like traffic light stop start conditions, but this doesn't have it. So this must be one of the early BMW 8 HP boxes. Um, it's just one less thing that's connected, although when you're using a Lamech, it doesn't do anything. But yeah, I just thought I'd make a comment. There's no canister there, which there normally is. Right, I'll give the pan a clean out. Uh, if you've been watching the channel for a while, you know I've had my fair share of problems with pans. So we've got another brand new pan coming. This is just gonna get put on the box uh, so that it gets mounted up in the car because we're not sure if we're gonna need to make a tail shaft or anything for the E46 yet. Uh, yeah, so it is the same pan, but we're not gonna put oil in it. It's never gonna do anything. It's just to protect this, keep the dust out while we get it all mounted up. Well, I say we, a man that's better at it than me, will probably do it anyway. We'll so I need a haircut. Guys, I have really enjoyed today. We've got the box ready to go back into the E46. Big shout out to Dan for letting me come down and do this to his car. Make some videos for you guys while I can't do it. Like I normally would. Um, yeah, sorry about the filming being a bit all over the place. There's so much stuff going on at this workshop. I keep getting distracted. Like we've got, I think 700 horsepower, 1.5J, 1000 horsepower RB26. It's just a plethora of car nut heaven. And I keep looking at all the builds and then cool stuff just rocks in all the time. Um, yeah, it's like, it's like being, I don't know. It's like, I don't know what it is. It's just really cool. I'm hanging around some really cool people doing some cool things with cars. I love it. And uh, there's gonna be more, there's gonna be more coming. Uh, hopefully we'll get the box in the car in the next couple of days. The thing we're not sure on, so that E46 had a, six speed manual from a 135 i think it was i think it was an n55 135 in it so hopefully tail shaft lengths are gonna be okay but we won't know until we actually get it up in the car and we've also got to get the torque converter modified so that it lines up with the flex plate properly you guys know how it works if you've got any questions about the ahp swap let me know below thank you very much for watching i'll catch you on the next one